Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me once again. If you're new here, welcome. Today's story is right out of a classic horror novel. We are taking it back home to New England once again. We are at the turn of the 19th century off the coast of New Hampshire on a little island called Smutty Nose. Smutty Nose is located about six miles off the coast of New Hampshire amongst a little group of islands called the Isle of Shoals. It's about a half mile long and not quite as wide. We are in the year 1868 and a couple named John and Marin Hauntvet immigrate to the U.S. from Norway, they end up making Smutty Nose their home. At the time, they were the only people living on Smutty Nose Island. John was a fisherman, and each morning he went out on his little boat, the Clarabella. He would bring in his fishing lines, reset the traps, then head to the mainland in Portsmouth, New Hampshire to sell his catch of the day. Marin spent most of her time at home. She was a homemaker. She was said to really enjoy decorating. She liked to have extravagant wallpapers. She did gardening and she took care of their dog. Classic New England woman. The haunt vents had been residing on the island of Smutty Nose for about two years when they met this guy named Louis Wagner. John was out one day on his boat and he happened to have conversation with this other fisherman, Louis, and he got along with him really well. He invited him home for supper. Him and his wife really got along with him, even though a lot of the other people on the surrounding islands kind of said Lewis was a sketchy character. They kind of tried to avoid him. Lewis was a 28 year old man from Prussia and he was described as a dark stranger with a tall muscular build and a thick accent. So John, Marin and Lewis become very close and he goes over there frequently. The three of them become very good friends. In May of 1872, Marin's sister, Karen Christensen, yeah, Marin and Karen, comes over from Norway to the States to join John and Marin on the island of Smutty Nose. She hopes to reside in the US permanently and find some work. She ends up finding a job as a maid at a nearby island called Appledore. And right around this time, John becomes very comfortable with his fishing business. He's doing very well and he decides to hire someone to help him. So his first thought is to hire his good friend, Louis Wagner, who's also a professional fisherman. It just made sense. Louis would also move into the haunt that house. It was just more convenient for him to live there while he was working with John. And then that October, John's brother Matthew, as well as Karen and Marin's brother Ivan, and his wife, Anife, all come over from Norway to start a life in the US and they start off living with the haunt vets. Ivan and Anife were newlyweds and they were said to be this gorgeous pair. Blonde hair, blue eyed, he was muscular. She had hair that went down to her knees. You know, they were this quintessential gorgeous couple. Ivan and Matthew join John on the fishing boat and Anithe helps Marin around the house. Around October of that year, Louis Wagner accepts another job with a local fisherman. I think it was just too crowded, probably, I would have to assume, for Louis in that house, so he decided to move on elsewhere. Unfortunately for Louis, the boat that he ended up working on actually capsized, and he had to find work on the mainland amongst the docks. He ended up working along the Portsmouth wharves for very little pay, and he rented a room from this family called the Johnsons on the mainland. By March of the following year, Louis was in very bad shape. He was said to have holes in his clothes and his shoes, and he was three weeks behind on rent. He just could not keep Keep up with the money he was making. So now we're into 1873. Karen has moved back into the haunt vet house. She's sort of in between jobs and John's business is very successful. He's still working as a fisherman and making a lot of money. On March 5th, John, Ivan, and Matthew start their day as usual. They go out to pull up their traps and they end up noticing that the winds have changed. So they tell their neighbor, to tell their wives that they won't be back for lunch. Normally the routine is that they would go back to their house for lunch. One of the men would stay at home with the ladies while the other two went to the mainland to sell their catch of the day. But today was gonna be different. They were just gonna go straight to Portsmouth. When the men arrive at the mainland, Lewis Wagner is there to greet them. He helps them tie up the boat and he asks them if they're planning on going back to Smutty Nose that night because he heard that the train from Boston is going to be late and the men usually waited for the train in order to get their fishing supplies. John said that they planned on going back to Smutty Nose that night, but if the train was too late, they would end up spending the night. And at this point, John and Lewis end up going their separate ways. Later on, Lewis gets word that the train from Boston will definitely be late 
and he realizes that this means the three men are going to be staying on the mainland that night. And Lewis comes up with a plan. Lewis is very familiar with the haunt that house since he had lived there for some time, and he's familiar with their belongings, and they have a lot of valuable things. And it would all be there for the taking. The men wouldn't be around to fight him off, and he figured he could deal with the women easily enough. So that night he steals a dory that was docked along the shore and starts rowing the 12 miles to Smutty Nose Island. To me this is crazy, rowing 12 miles. I guess that this is not really a tall order for someone that's a professional fisherman. To you and I, at least to myself, this is kind of unimaginable. Like how is he navigating in the dark? Anyway, he starts rowing the 12 miles to Smutty Nose Island, somehow navigating his way in the dark. I don't know. Around 10 p.m. at the haunt bed house, the women decide to turn in for the night. Marin and Anithe go into the bedroom off of the kitchen, and Karen decides she wants to sleep by the fire that night, so she gets a mattress. I guess upstairs it was pretty cold and she wanted to stay by the fire. Same. When Lewis arrives to the island, he doesn't dock his boat where John normally would dock his boat. He decides to dock it on the far end of the island. He waits several hours to make sure that the women are in fact asleep and he enters the house through the front door. The front door is unlocked because the women were still expecting the men to come back that night. Lewis quietly enters the home and shuts the door behind him. Then he goes to the bedroom where Marin and Anithe were sleeping and he wedges it shut with a piece of wood. But what Lewis wasn't expecting is that Karen was asleep right there on the kitchen floor. He also wasn't thinking about the dog who starts barking frantically and Karen wakes up and she goes, John, is that you? Marin's also waking up in the bedroom because she hears all the barking and she hears Karen asking if it's John. She says, is everything all right out there? And Karen says, oh, it's just John, he scared me. But right as she says this, Lewis picks up the chair and starts hitting Karen over the head. Karen obviously starts screaming. She's yelling, John is killing me. She can't see that it's actually Lewis. But really quick to jump to that conclusion, Karen. During this struggle, a clock is knocked off the wall and it stopped at 1.07 a.m. That's how we know exactly what time this was all happening. Marin is screaming from the bedroom, trying to open the door, and she's realizing that it's jammed shut. In the struggle between Lewis and Karen, Karen is thrown up again. Ooh. Karen is thrown against the bedroom door and this causes the latch to come loose and she falls into the bedroom. Marin manages to get Karen inside and barricade the door. She's screaming to Anithe to run, run, run. Anithe is kind of just frozen in shock and I hope I'm saying her name right. Anithe kind of snaps out of it and runs to the window and starts to climb out. But at this point, Lewis had given up on the door and had gone around outside knowing that the women would most likely climb out the window. So Anithe is standing there barefoot in the snow in shock, yelling, Lewis, Lewis, when she realizes it's him. Marin runs to the window thinking that this is impossible, there's no way it's Lewis. But right as she looks out the window, she sees Lewis grab an ax from the wood pile and strike Anithe in the head. Marin would later say that when this happened, she was so close to Lewis that she could have reached out and touched his arm. Lewis continues to strike Anithe as she's laying on the ground and Marin turns her attention back to her sister. She needs to wake her up, they need to get out. But Karen took so many blows to the head that she was barely conscious and she couldn't even stand up. Lewis starts to make his way back to the house and Marin realizes that she is now faced with an impossible decision. She could either remain there and be killed with an ax with her sister or escape and leave Karen there by herself to be killed by Lewis. Marin knew that they would both be doomed if she stayed, so she wraps herself up in a wool skirt and climbs out the window, and her dog follows her. Marin runs barefoot through the snow to the cove where she expected there would be a boat, but she looked on in sheer panic as she realized there was no boat at all, and she realized she had to find some place to hide. Her mind was racing, and she thought she could hide in the basement of the abandoned building on the island, but then she realized obviously that's gonna be the first place Lewis looks. Marin makes her way to the other side of the island, trying to keep a safe distance from the house, but she said she could hear the screams of her sister from inside. She would end up crawling between two rocks on the water's edge and would huddle with her dog all night till morning. Back at the house, Karen had tried to escape through the window, but Lewis struck her with the ax as she was trying to climb out. And as she laid on the floor still breathing, he strangled her with a handkerchief. Lewis then runs frantically around the island trying to find Marin. He looked in the basement of the abandoned house just as Marin thought he would. So luckily she didn't hide there, but Lewis could not find her and he realized 
realized that if he was going to escape before the sun came up, he had to just leave. And he expected that Marin would probably die of exposure anyway. She was outside in the middle of winter barefoot in a nightdress. So Lewis goes back to the house. He hides Karen's body under the bed and drags Anithe out to the kitchen. Why? Then he makes himself some food and a cup of tea and ransacks the house for money. He ends up finding $15, which is worth about $400 in today's money. Marin remains in her hiding spot until about 8 a.m. where she tries to attract the attention of some workmen on a nearby island, but fails. Instead, she stumbles across the breakwater to an island connected to Smutty Nose called Malaga. And from the other side of Malaga, she attracts the attention of some children playing on Appledore Island. The children tell their father, George, who quickly rescues Marin and brings her back inside with his wife and George goes back to Smutty Nose to investigate the scene. He could not find Lewis anywhere. Lewis was long gone, but he did witness the scene of the crime and what was left. He returns to Appledore to wait for John, Ivan, and Matthew to return from the mainland. In a few hours, they flag down John's boat and they wave them to the island. Matthew and Ivan get off on the tender, the little boat attached to the larger boat, and they row to Appledore. Once there, George tells them there's been some trouble on Smutty Nose. Ivan goes sort of into a panic and he's asking Marin, where's Anithe, where's Anithe? And all Marin can say is, she's at home. Matthew and Ivan get back in that boat and row to Smutty Nose so fast that they get there at the same time as John. When they get into the house, they see what has happened. And of course, Ivan is completely distraught when he sees Anithe and runs back outside and collapses in the snow. The three of them go back to Appledore and John, George, and a few other men go back to Portsmouth, New Hampshire to report what has happened to the Portsmouth police. A description of Lewis Wagner is sent out to all the local police stations and it makes the evening paper headlines. Two men come forward and they say they actually did see Lewis Wagner early that morning about 6 a.m. And the police discovered that Lewis returned to his boarding house at the Johnson's early that morning and he ended up leaving for the 9 a.m. train to Boston. Once he was there, he got some new shoes, new clothes, and ended up visiting some women that he knew at a boarding house in Boston. John was familiar with all of Lewis's local hangouts in Boston and told the police exactly where they could find Lewis and the police ended up finding him that night, and Lewis let the officers take him without incident. The next day, Lewis was transferred by train back to Portsmouth from Boston, where it was said that a crowd of 10,000 gathered in the street for blood. I feel like that number may have been exaggerated over the years, but I'm sure it was a lot of people. Three days later, Lewis was transferred again to Maine because technically Smutty Nose, even though it's off the coast of Portsmouth, is part of Maine, and he had to be tried in the Maine court system. This time, hundreds of angry fishermen gathered to greet Lewis, and it was so bad that the police had to call the Marines for backup. They were throwing bricks and rocks at Lewis, and they were out for blood. Lewis's trial began on June 9, 1873, and lasted for nine days. A number of witnesses were called to the stand, including the family members of the house that Lewis boarded in. They said that Lewis had not slept in his room the night of the murders and returned the next morning windburned, cut up, and agitated. Another witness called to the stand said that Lewis once told him that if he was ever desperate enough, he would kill for money. A sex worker from Boston said that Lewis told her that he in fact killed two people and had intended on killing a third. Lewis actually took the stand himself and was said to be rambling and incoherent. He said the night of the murders, he was out baiting trawls. And when he was asked, well, which boat were you on? What captain did you work for? Or what wharf were you working from? He forgot. He couldn't remember any of it. He said that after work, he went for a few drinks at a local pub, but he couldn't remember the name of the pub either. A button from one of the women was found on Lewis at the time of his arrest. And I guess this button was very rare. No one else would have had it. I mean, you think back then, you didn't have a local Walmart where everyone had the same buttons. It was a handmade button that only she would have had. It was inevitably the testimony of Marin Hauntvet that convicted Lewis Wagner. Less than an hour of deliberation, the jury found Lewis guilty and he was sentenced to death. But less than a week later, Lewis escapes from jail. But unfortunately for Lewis, his face was plastered everywhere at this point and everyone knew who he was, much like our last case. He was quickly recaptured and brought back to prison. On June 25th, 1875, 27 months after the crime, 
Lewis was hanged at the state prison in Thomaston, Maine. Lewis proclaimed his innocence until the very end. And this sort of made some people second guess if they had convicted the right person. An alternate theory was that Marin was the killer. Maybe she got too fed up with life on the island and got a little stir crazy and wanted to kill her sister and sister-in-law. I'm pretty much convinced that Lewis was the killer. However, it is possible that Marin could have been somehow involved in it. Maybe her and Lewis had an affair and things went wrong. They planned on running away together and then there was a change of plans. Maybe he turned on her or she turned on him. The only reason I kind of wonder this is because for me there's a small hole in the story, but maybe if Marin was here she could explain it. The thing I don't get is that Marin allegedly couldn't wake up her sister to climb out the window with her, but when Lewis killed Karen, she had been halfway out the window and had struck her while she was trying to climb out. It couldn't have been that much time between Marin running out the window and Lewis getting into the room and Karen trying to escape as well. But like I said, Marin's not here to defend herself. Marin and John Hauntvet would end up moving to the mainland to Portsmouth where John would continue to work as a fisherman. They would eventually welcome a child together but unfortunately their marriage could not survive and Marin ended up moving back to Norway. I don't know if she took her child with her. I would have to assume that she did. Ivan took up work as a carpenter the summer of 1873 and it was said that he would not speak unless spoken to and very much kept to himself. And after the summer passed, Ivan also moved back to Norway. The haunt bed house no longer stands and the island is now privately owned. Lewis's victims, Karen and Anithe, were buried side by side at a cemetery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They had matching epitaphs that read, A sudden death, a striking call, a warning voice that speaks to all. To all, be prepared to die. A little dramatic, yeah? I think it's pretty cut and dry that Lewis was the killer, even though he proclaimed his innocence to the end. But I'd love to know what you guys think. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week.